Hello, everyone. It's Mark Sabatella from Mastering Muse Core, and welcome to the Muse Core Cafe. So, for those of you who are new, welcome, uh, and also for those of you who are returning, welcome. And uh, this is my regular series I do on Wednesdays, where we talk about making music using Muse Core, and uh, we normally have kind of a theme for the week. Uh, but the first Wednesday of the month, which is what this is, it's in fact the first day of the month period, our theme is Ask Me Anything. So anything is fair game. I mean, you know, preferably relating to Muse score, but whatever. Um, if there's time, I can answer your questions about music or whatever, whatever else you might be interested in that you think I might have insight into. So um, just feel free to be entering your questions in here. And I will recommend that when... Uh, when asking your questions, if you click down here in the chat here and you'll see the add emoji button, when you click that, if you type into the search field the word question, you'll see question marks show up here. And then you can click that little question mark and say, add an emoji before your question like this. It's not totally necessary, but it will help make sure that your questions stand out from any of the other comments in the chat. So that's just a, a, a recommendation that I have. So what I'm going to do uh, while waiting to see what kind of questions we come in is I'm going to address a couple of things that have come up recently in the for, in the uh, um, in my community and uh, try to answer a few questions that have come up uh, as well as you know. So I'll jump back and forth between things that were already posted and things that come up here. So. Rod has a question here. Ah, I see. Uh, yeah, this is a really uh, a good thing that uh, to know about that comes up pretty often. So I'm going to create a new score. And, and what he's asking for, he's, he's got a grand staff, and it's going to have part of it be uh, have both staves, and part of it just have a single staff. So I'm going to go ahead and create my grand staff score. And I'll go ahead and enter some notes. And uh, I'm just entering some silly notes because it doesn't really matter what they are for this demonstration. And uh, let me just get this size so I can see the chat. There we go. I'm going to enter some notes here. And then I'm just going to fill my score. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Oh, well, you said the first eight. Whatever. Um, I'm going to delete uh the first whatever several bars worth of i'm going to delete the bass clef notes from here so that this is basically rod what your score looks like you know a more musical version of this right i want to get it to all fit on the screen at once so you've got a, a system or two here or three or four however many systems you have where there's really only content on one staff and then content on the other what i'm going to do is i'm going to right click that bass clef staff and go to staff part properties. And then I'm gonna set an option here where it says hide when empty instead of auto, which means it depends on some global score wide setting. I'm gonna set it to always. By setting hide when empty to always, it will now hide that staff whenever it is empty. And so you'll see it's empty on the first system. And so it's hidden, it's not empty on the second system. So it's shown it's not empty on the third system here, so we can see it, but it is empty on the fourth system, so it's hidden again. So that is that is it. You right-click the staff that you want to sort of have come in and out, uh, right-click it, go to Staff Part Properties, set Hide When Empty to Always. There's a couple other methods that can also, depending on the specific situation, uh, do the right thing, but that's usually what you're going to want. That way it only affects that one staff and you don't have other staves randomly disappearing on you. So um, I'm going to next, uh, again, you know, while waiting for other questions to come in, <clears throat> I'm going to address something Jeannie here asks, and I don't know if you're here, Jeannie, today, but I'll post this here. And she's asking about having a piano score and getting it to play um, only the right hand or only the left hand. So let's use my silly little score here as an example. And um, let's actually, let me load a better score here. Let's, let's load an actual uh, piano score up. I will load my reunion score. 
And let me make sure I can still see my chat. There we go. Um, and I do see, uh, Kevin, your question there as well, and I'll come to that in a second. But uh, let's see. Here's Reunion. And this is a piano piece. And uh, the the question is going to be how to play just the left hand or just the right hand. And there was some discussion of some various different ways. But let me show you the way that works uh, right now, probably the best overall. I'm going to select the first measure of this staff. And here again, let me uh, size things. I'm, I'm liking the sizing better than the pinning of the uh, chat because then I can actually type into the chat when I need to also. Anyhow, um, uh, I'm going to select the first measure. Well, let's say I only want to hear the right hand. I'm going to select the first measure of the left hand and then use shift control end to select all the way to the end of the score. Um, and so now I have that selected the entire left hand. Then I'm going to come over to the properties plan panel and I'm just going to turn off the play option. Play here has got a check mark by it by default. I'm going to turn that off. And now when I play the score, it doesn't play because I just turned off the play property and then I can turn it back on when I'm ready. So that's probably the easiest way of doing this. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, I am going to, Susan, just address the question mark thing again. So watch. I know I did that kind of quickly. Where you type your chat, see the little icon? The second icon from the left says add emoji. You click that, and then there's a search bar here. And in that search bar, just type the word question or the first few letters of it, and it will show you the question mark icons. And then you can click it, and there's your icon. There you go. Okay, so now let's come back and uh, Kevin is asking about, ah, pauses at the end of a line of music. Yeah, this is good. And this is a great one to know about in the context of uh, the Harmony course where we're working on these little examples. So um, if you have multiple pieces on a single sheet of music, a single score, like for instance, different movements of a larger work, or two different harmonizations of the same song, for instance. You often want to kind of separate those. And so the way we're going to do that is I'm going to put, uh, well, I'll just do that with Reunion because it works. So I'm going to take Reunion here. And after the first system, let's pretend um, uh, that this is where I want to end it after this first system. Notice that right now I have a system break here. Um, there's a system break there. Uh, and I got that by hitting enter, right? Well, instead of hitting enter, I'm going to go over to the palettes and I'm going to open the layout palette. And here you will find this symbol here that says section break. A section break is going to add that break there, but it does a few things in addition to that. Like actually, let me not do it there because I don't like what it just did. I'm gonna do it in this measure right here. I'm gonna add my section break here. So what the section break does is it says, this is the end of a piece. And so it does a number of things that you wouldn't normally do, like it indents the first system of the next thing. And it also restarts the measure numbering. Notice the measure numbering was five, six, seven, eight, nine. This should have been measure 10, but notice there's no measure number on it. And the next system starts with measure five. So that's because um, this break basically says we're done with this piece. And that's really nice because now the measure numbering, if you've got two different harmonizations, if you're doing this for the harmony course and you've got two different harmonizations of the same melody, then their measure numbers are going to line up because they're it's going to start over again at one. So that's nice. And getting back to the original question, it's going to pause. So if I play this now, here's the pause. And then it continues. If you select that section break and then come over to properties, you'll see that you can set how long that break is. You can also control whether the new section starts with instrument names again. Um, 
and you can control whether the measure numbers reset. You, you have some control over how that kind of stuff works. But anyhow, section breaks are your answer for creating this separation between pieces. Also, it does nice things like if there was a key change right there instead of in the next bar, if this was going to be my D major key signature here, <clears throat> Notice it doesn't put a courtesy key signature at the end of the pre previous system. Section breaks also do that. It, it disables the normal thing of courtesy key signatures at the end of systems, which you want normally on key changes, but you don't need for uh, when you actually have multiple movements of a piece. You don't need to see these courtesy signatures. So section breaks, definitely the good thing. And and Suzanne, I'm actually kind of curious. When uh, you said that you couldn't get to the question mark, you have the emoji button and you have the search box, but then you type the word Q-U-E-S into it and question mark icons don't show up because I would have thought those emojis were pretty standardized. Um, so I'm wondering if if literally you you see the emoji button and you see the search box, but the word question doesn't pop up. I also wonder if maybe if your browser is set to a different language, if you have to search for whatever the other language is instead of the word question. I don't really know. Anyhow, I'm going to actually answer your actual question now. Um, the attached score has everything jumbled at the end. So First of all, I see a PDF here rather than like an actual score that I can do something with. So it'd be a little more useful. Oh, did I just mess myself up? I have to make sure I didn't. Um, sometimes when I try to open a PDF from in here, uh, it cuts me off, but it looks like it didn't. All right, good. So I'm going to open this score here. Uh, this PDF file and see what you mean here and see if I can say. So, all right, you've got your PDF here. And now let me see if I can see what your question is. Uh, oh yeah, cut and paste from, from someone else's question mark. That's a good idea. Um, everything jumbled at the end. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, the, the, it's definitely a lot there. So, what I would say here is, I mean, that's, there's, as I often say in situations like this, there's sort of no getting around uh, the laws of physics. If you've got that many words, they are going to, and you have them all on the same system, they are going to be pretty crowded. So what I would suggest is don't try to put these all on the same system. So I would recommend looking at this and saying, well, you've got plenty of room to spare on this page. Let's add some system breaks. So again, if this was a MuseScore file instead of a PDF, I could help a little better. But I would maybe add, um, add a system break after the third bar here, because this looks kind of crowded too. Select this measure here and hit enter. That'll add a system break. And then select a measure here and hit enter. Basically just add more breaks so that this takes up more lines of music. Then things won't need to be as crowded. I mean, you can certainly pick a smaller font size for your lyrics, but that's not going to make it easier to read. So I'm going to recommend spreading things out more. So uh, that'll be my recommendation. Um, okay, so did I miss someone else's question? I feel like maybe I might have. Um, oh, it says you try to divide it, it's messed up. So yeah, that I won't be able to help with from just a PDF. I'll need the actual score to help with. Um, but it should work because you're right. It does look like there's plenty of room for another system here. So if you select a measure and hit enter, it, it should work out okay. So I guess I would have to tell. All right. Uh, um, so Kevin's got a good question about harp glissandi. And um, I'm actually going to show you something new. So first of all, if you add a gliss, let's go ahead and create a new score for harp. Uh, choose instruments. I'm going to pick strings plucked harp. And I'm going to give it a key signature of D. All right, I've got my harp score now. And again, I'm going to size my window nicely. If I add the 
these notes here. Let me put a dynamic on it so it's a little uh, more audible here. If I add myself a dynamic here, and then I add a, a glissando, and I don't have the, the uh, arpeggios and glissandis palette added here, so I'm going to add it. I'm in one of my uh, demo workspaces here. So I add the palette, so I have the glissando, and now I open this and I add the gliss. Let's listen to what it does. It's pretty chromatic, right? The default for gliss is chromatic. However, if I then click that and go to properties, you'll see under the playback tab here, I can change it from chromatic to white keys to black keys. Obviously, that's piano um, or diatonic. If you pick the diatonic option, it will acknowledge the key signature. Now, that is, of course, way too slow for the gliss. It thinks it's going to try to do it that slowly. You'd have to um, fine tune how you actually notate your uh, gliss. Um, you know, if you want it to not start until beat four, maybe you would make this be a dotted half tied to a quarter and then have the quarter gliss up. There's things like that you can do to control how, when the gliss starts. But in any case, it goes by the key signature. The diatonic option goes by the key signature. So harp, harp, people writing for harp have been kind of resorting to adding uh, invisible extra key signatures every time there's a pedal change and they need the gliss to respect the current setting of the pedals. Um, so that's what people have been doing, adding kind of invisible key signatures that are customized to specifically be to that pedal setting. But as of MuseScore 4.2, I'm really uh, excited. There's going to be a pedal option um, for the gliss. And if I run the nightly build for MuseScore, uh, this is going to show me what's eventually going to be 4.2. 4.2 should be out. I, I, you know, I haven't heard any updates, but based on the progress that I'm seeing, I'm going to guess December or January. So if I now run this nightly build, I think I'm going to see that. Uh, um, pedal option. And that's going to mean that it's going to respect the actual pedal settings um, that exist. So if I create a new score in 4.2 and pick harp, uh, I added two, but that's okay. Um, let's go ahead and do the thing of adding the dotted half D and then tie it to a quarter and then have my high D up here and put in my gliss. I'm gonna put in my gliss. Uh, do I have my, I haven't added that palette to my nightly build, so I'll do that. Add my gliss. And select it. And go to properties, playback, style, no, oh, it's not in yet, or it isn't working yet. Dang it. Uh, I know it's being worked on. Uh, so maybe someone else who's uh, been following this knows more about the status, but I know the code is there. Anyhow, that will work. Um, so that's an option. Uh, let me come back now to where I can see my chat and my comments. Um, So, uh, yeah, that is that is the answer. There will be an option to get it to follow the pedal. And in case you haven't seen the pedal stuff, that's also under the palettes here. If I go to the, uh, if I go to the palettes and say add palettes, I want to add my harp palette. And then once I've added my harp palette, I will have now the ability to add harp diagrams that say what the positions are. So say I want my F sharp and my C sharp, but for whatever particular reason, maybe I want it to be a, uh, um, a Lydian gliss, I can put in that G sharp there. And now these are my, pal my pedal positions. And in 4.2, there will be the option where it can follow that. In fact, okay, wait a minute. Maybe it doesn't show up as a separate option. Maybe, maybe diatonic just does that if you're harp. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? I gotta find out. I'm gonna add myself 
I'm going to learn something here. Um, I'm going to add a heart pedal diagram and set it to F sharp, G sharp, and C sharp and see what it plays now. Okay, well, that's still the chromatic version, is it not? Yeah, it's still totally diatonic, I think. Um, but we'll find out. Um, we'll, uh, so will for to include markings for the feet on the pedal board. So I'm not sure what markings those are, Allison, if you want to tell me more about them. I feel like you might have said something about this before, but I'm not, I'm not sure what they look like. But if they are, what I will say, and so this is a general answer to the question, um, uh, if the symbol you're talking about is commonly found in published music, you will always be able to add it from the master palette. So if you go to view, master palette, and then symbols, and then here I type organ, these symbols all have to do with organ, apparently. German, great, C sharp. Yeah, these are all German, uh, German organ tablature symbols, which I didn't even know what those were. But uh, in any case, um, uh, any symbols that exist uh, in in published music is therefore, or, or that exist commonly enough in published music for them to have included in what's called the Smoofle standard, standard music font layout. If it's part of the Smoofle standard, it's in this palette here, and then you would be able to add it to your score. If not, we would ha you'd have to get it added to the Smoofle standard. So you go to smoofle.org for that. So let me type where that is, smoofle.org. Um, and that is how you spell it, standard music font layout. All right, uh, I see Michael having a question, and I see Chiana, your question as well, but I'm going to back up and make sure I uh, catch other things. So, Peter, um, quick tips for moving. Um, you know, realistically, Peter, 95% uh, of scores in MuseScore, MuseScore 3 scores, you'll just open them in MuseScore 4, and they'll just be fine. They won't look any different. They'll just, they'll look subtly better because the spacing is better and they will sound better um, because of Muse sounds. Um, so for like 95% of scores, there's nothing to do. Um, every once in a while though, yeah, there'll be some score that uses some feature that's changed in some way or some formatting that's like the, the faults are improved. And so now old manual adjustments don't work anymore. You know, th th there might be, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, situations where you might need to fiddle with that. I did a cafe episode on that, and we we saw all sorts of funny corner cases and things. Um, but in general, don't expect problems. Basically, just don't expect problems. What I will say is don't save over your original file. If you have any doubt whatsoever, make a copy. So either copy your MuseScore 3 file before opening it in 4, or open it in 4, then immediately do a save as into another folder, or, you know, put a new name on it or something. Generally, if you, you know, make your changes, because you won't, be, once you've saved it in MuseScore 4, you won't be able to open it in MuseScore 3. So um, if you have any thoughts that you might need to still open it in MuseScore 3, I would just keep a separate copy. All right. Now, Sachana, I see your question there, and it's going to be a little complicated to answer, so I'm going to come back to it and try to answer some quick ones first, and then we'll come back, because I feel like that's going to be a little difficult. If you can um, if, if you can post instead of just the picture, no, I think I can do it from the picture. I think I can do it from the picture, so I'm going to come back to that. All right. Um, so, okay, so Suzanne now has her score where I can get to it. So that's great. And let's go ahead and see. <clears throat> so I will open this score. Let's open it in, make sure that I'm opening it in the real new score, not in the nightly build. So I just saved it to my test folder. And um, I haven't opened this folder yet today. So uh, Google is having to feed it to me. 
So give me a moment. Meanwhile, Mac compatibility issues, Michael. So you have to tell me which Mac compatibility issues you mean. I'm not aware of any specific Mac compatibility issues. I know that there's certain things. Uh, well, there's the basic issue that Mac doesn't support multiple windows very well. And as far as I know, Apple hasn't fixed that and we haven't found a workaround to it. So the fact that multiple windows open separately, I don't know that there's going to be any solution anytime soon unless Apple fixes it on their end. Other than that, I'm not aware of any specific Mac compatibility issues. I remember you were having some issues with MIDI input and latency, and that's not specifically about Mac compatibility, um, but they, they're, they're, they are working on that and have made some improvements from what I understand. <coughs> Okay, and Allison, I see that you're talking about these V and U, and yeah, I remember you mentioning these, and I think you posted a picture. And I guess all I can say is if they are really a, a thing that's used in published music, they're part of that palette. And so um, I'm trying to find which of my windows I had that palette open in, because I think it's still open in one of my windows. Maybe not. I'm just going to open it. Um, so if I open up the master palette, if I go to edit preferences, no, not edit preferences. What am I doing? I go to view master palette symbols and I type pedal into the search. Okay. Here are the symbols here. They just don't say organ. They're just pedal heel. So here are the symbols. And so the thing is you would have to add these to your score and you can add them to individual notes. Like I can click a note and then click the symbol and it's gonna appear directly on top of that note. So what you would need to do is then manually position it. And I'm not gonna recommend that. Here is how I'm gonna recommend doing it. I'm gonna recommend, let me undo that, that I'm gonna add it as text. So I'm gonna type um, control T to add staff text. And then I'm gonna go to the special characters palette, insert special characters here. And under musical symbols, I'm going to have all those same things available. And I think that's under keyboard techniques. There they are. So if I click that symbol, it's going to add it now within that bit of text. And there it is. And now I can press X to flip it below the staff. And then, you know, you can play with the size of it and so forth. So that's what I would suggest. And if you're, if it's not a vocal piece, add them as lyrics and then they'll automatically align also. I won't, it's cheating to add pedal symbols as lyrics, but I won't tell if you don't. Or instead of adding as lyrics, less cheating might be to add them as, uh, add text, add them as no, don't pick fingering, pick sticking. That's for drum music. And this is the closest analogy to this. It tells you how to play that note in the same way that the left and right stick symbols uh, do that. So in any case, um, that's the best I can suggest as far as that goes. All right, so um, glad to see now I've got more questions uh, adding up here. So let's see now. Uh, what is going on with this score in terms of this? So I had mentioned that I would want, okay, so first of all, it looks like you've forced all of those symbols onto all those measures onto the same system and they just don't fit. Like I said, there's no getting around the, the, the laws of physics here. If that's how big your font is, that you just can't put that many words on a system and expect them to fit. So I'm gonna delete those symbols forcing, these are the symbols that keep measures on the same uh, system. So I'm deleting all those symbols and now suddenly they spread out nicely. And then you can look at it and go, well, I can do better, right? I could maybe, uh, I could probably, I'm just going to delete all these line breaks here and add some of my own. I'm going to add one here. I'm kind of eyeballing this there. This looks nicely balanced. Now, if your piece is in four bar phrases and you want to try to fit four bars on a system, you're going to need smaller uh, page sizes for that. How did I do it? I just pressed delete. So I click whatever symbol I want to delete and then I press the delete key on my keyboard or backspace on a Mac. Um, so it's uh, just click that symbol. So again, to get back 
where we started, it's all these symbols that you added here, the keep measures on same uh, system symbol, just click it and press delete. And if you click those and press delete, MuseScore will no longer try to force those measures onto the same system. And, and then you won't have that overcrowded business happening. All right, um, so backing up, uh, I think, okay, Shanna, I, I, I'm going to try to get your question in here because I saw you asked it on, on Reddit and it just wasn't uh, a good time or place for me to uh, to address that. So what you've got here is 16th notes and then what appears to be an eighth note kind of beamed across the bar. So yeah, this is going, so there's no way to do that as actual eighth notes. You're just going to have to lie um, and make those be 16th notes and then tie and then beam them across the bar and hide something in here. That's that's really the only thing that I'm going to be able to suggest. So I'm going to try it here. I'm going to enter some 16ths. And yours piece is in like 3.8, it looks like. So I'll go ahead and change to 3.8 time signature. 3.8. And I'll enter some notes. I don't know what clef that is, but we're going to pretend it's treble clef and then b flat and then e and then a and then c oops this a is down here and then b and then e and then a and then c and then b flat Something like that, right? So these are the notes. And if they're not exactly the right notes, don't sweat it. And then what I would have to do is add in another voice um, some of those same notes. So I'll add a 16th rest and then the B flat and then a 16th rest and then the A and then a 16th rest and then the B and then a 16th rest and then the A. And now what I'll do is uh, beam across those rests by going to properties and saying, I want to beam across that rest. Oh, but it's going to look like a 16th note beam, right? Uh, yeah, that's, um, that's unfortunate because if I add it as an eighth note, I see, I see what you're saying here. Now, if I, if, is there a way to, to make that beam look like an eighth note beam? Uh, no. Um, yeah, you might be stuck. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, what if, yeah, you might, there, there might be more fakery involved. You're, you're pretty clever. You've come up with some pretty clever solutions. Um, uh, hmm. Cause yeah, th this one, obviously I could make that note B flat be an eighth note and that would be fine. And I could make this a also be an eighth note and that would be fine. Um, but uh, there's there's no getting around the fact that that B natural here, you, you, you won't be able to make it be an eighth without playing some really horrible tricks. So I don't have a great solution for you there, but I encourage your creativity. Um, and uh, worst case, you just have to draw a line yourself and position it manually. But maybe someone else has a clever solution um, here. So anyhow, let me uh, talk about... Um, uh, so Christopher has a question about um, whether MuseScore might work better with narrator than other screen readers. So I don't have extensive enough experience to say with any certainty about that. I can just say that some people have said that. I've seen people say that. So I don't know to what extent it's true, but it might be. Um, so I, I don't have any, I don't really have any information for you about that other than that's the rumor I've heard, but it could just be someone just did some quick testing and some particular thing worked better. So that I really can't say. What I will say is JAWS does allow for scripting, right? And that in principle, someone could come up with JAWS scripts to improve the things that aren't working well. And one of the do JAWS developers has been working behind the scenes to improve the screen reader support within MuseScore, but so far he hasn't published his work yet. And so I know he's done some of this work and uh, if he wants to get it in for 4.2, now would be a really good time. So I might try to uh, ping him 
And if you can remind me later, Christopher, maybe uh, send me a direct message uh, in the community and I'll go see if he's got stuff ready to, to, to publish because we'd love to get his improvements into 4.2 if possible. But um, uh, that's all I can say. So, um, so, um, so, so Michael's following up on his thing about the latency issue. Yeah, so the latency issue isn't a Mac compatibility issue as far as we know. It's just some drivers seem to be slow. So there is some work for 4.2 to try to improve that. And some of that work is already part of those nightly builds and some isn't. So I will encourage you to download a nightly build and try for yourself. And for people who have never downloaded a nightly build, they're kind of cool. They they let you see what's, you know, the current status of MuseScore, um, you know, what's going to become the next version, and they don't interfere with your current version. So to get to the nightly builds, I'm gonna go to MuseScore.org and then download software. And then if I scroll down towards the bottom, where it says development builds, nightly builds, download page. And you'll see download nightly builds here for Mac OS. And because uh, I know you're on Mac, um, and you'll see that you can just download the latest master and it'll be a DMG file. It'll install in parallel to your regular MuseCore 4. And that way you can um, see for yourself if any of the improvements they've made so far help on your system. But unfortunately, hardware issues and driver issues are a little bit out of the control of the MuseCore team and certainly outside of my own areas of expertise. And so uh, I'm, I'm of limited help <laughs> with that sort of thing. All right, um, so Chris Allen has question about the Tukoda symbol. Uh, what? Tukoda will be placed at the beginning of the measure? Um, Tukoda. Oh, 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 okay, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, so, so Chris, um, yeah, don't do what you just said. In other words, don't, I'm going to put a line break here and I'm going to um, uh, add to Coda. Yeah, so don't use the Coda symbol. If you go to the repeats palette here, I think this is the nightly build one here, um, but it's all the same. If I add the Coda here, this is not to Coda. This is the marker for the Coda. And if I add this, it's not going to play back correctly. It's not, and it's going to show up at the beginning because it thinks it's the coda marker and not, in fact, the two coda sign. So definitely always add the two coda to get the correct positioning, the correct behavior in other respects. Let me add another line break so that we can see two coda really is at the end of the measure. But then if you want to see the symbol in there, go to the special characters palette. So press properties and, uh, Well, that's interesting. I don't see special characters showing up in here like I normally. Oh, there it is. Uh, I have to move the cursor. Insert special characters, and there's the coda sign. So that way you can put the coda sign in place of the word coda or in addition, and then you can select it and increase its font size. I think somewhere around 18 is probably the standard size. And you can also delete the word two if you want. So add two coda from the palette to get the correct positioning and behavior, and then just edit the text to contain the coda sign using that special characters palette. All right, I am now going to try to um, follow up also with Suzanne's score here, where She had uh, tried deleting some stuff. So you said, I think I saw you say that you don't even know how you added those symbols. I'll tell you how those symbols got added, whether you did it or whether this is someone else's score that you've inherited. I, I don't really know. Um, but let me let me show you how those symbols would have gotten added. Those, okay, yes, yeah, so now you've deleted those. Um, the way those symbols got added is by selecting the measures and then you would go to the palettes, the layout palette, and then this one here, keep measures on the same system. Um, depending on which version of MuseScore you have, it might be labeled a little bit differently, but um, keep measures on the same system. 
is the uh, is what I think the label is. It might be called group measures, uh, and it will force those measures onto the same system. And then what I want to do is now delete those guys. So you've deleted all but one of them, so I'm going to delete this one. And well, you've put a line break here, and yes, it will spread those out. That's correct, right? So if you don't want it that way, maybe delete that one. I think this is too many measures on this system. This one's looking crowded. You're going to have to use some judgment here. So I'm putting only three systems on that one, deleting this line break, so that I now have three three measures on each system, and they don't look too squished nor too spread out. This is something that, in principle, someone could design an AI algorithm that would attempt to sort out uh how to balance the measures most appropriately and fill the page most appropriately. But I certainly wouldn't trust that AI algorithm. You're going to have to use your own judgment to decide where you want each system to end to give you the best balance of measures. And so just start by deleting all your line breaks and then in, and then judge for yourself where to put them in to get the most pleasing results. That's, that's basically what you have to do. Um, all right. So did I miss something else in here? I feel like there was at least another question that I haven't answered. Mm -hmm. Maybe not, maybe not, maybe I've got them all. Am I caught up? I think I'm caught up. All right. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, uh, okay. I'm just scrolling and, and reading here, and I think uh, I think I've caught up. So if I've missed a question, someone please let me know if I've missed anything. Um, but I think I haven't. So uh, there you go. That, that's that's uh, some things. Oh yes, and there's still a spurious one of these here. I'm just going to delete all of these guys here. Um, so because those shouldn't be there. Unless you're deliberately trying to create super crowded music, I wouldn't be using that. And yeah, this still looks a little crowded, like maybe like that last measure, that last system. Oh, I've probably undone too many things. I got to undo, I want three, three and three. That looks good to me. This one and four, you know, I, I, I could keep judging. I could keep rearranging things, keep playing around with where the breaks are. Because there is some value in having four measures on a system if your music happens to phrase that way, which a lot of it does, of course. But when you have lyrics, that's just often going to be too much. Four measures with lyrics is often just too many measures unless you go with a small size. Now, one other thing, Suzanne, um, if you're using the default page size, I will say that that's big for choral music. So if I go to format page settings, yeah, you have letter paper and 1.75 staff space. Choral music is often held in the hand, so it's closer to your eyes than a music stand would be. So it's pretty common in choral music to use smaller staff size. So you can go down to like 1.6 or so, you know, it's sort of a judgment call, or even 1.5 for the staff space size. And with smaller staff spaces, suddenly four measures on a system doesn't look so overcrowded. Now, the question is, is that really too small? Well, you won't know until you print it and actually hold it in your hand. But definitely be aware that for choral music, you can often get away with a smaller staff size. Conversely, you probably want smaller paper, too. It's, it's typically printed on paper that's more like six by nine or some, something like that instead of letter. Um, but you probably don't have access to paper like that. So doing it letter size paper is fine. So anyhow, those are some things uh, that people might want to be aware of. So I'm going to flip back over to the community and attempt to see if I can make sense out of uh, something that was asked here. Uh, yeah, I think this is, I I'm going to have to look at this separately because this is a complicated question that Kevin, so Kevin, I don't know, McDonald, I don't know if you're here uh, today, but I'm going to, I'm going to look at this separately and then try to answer because uh, we talked about it in office hours and I sort of understood what you meant, but there's a lot going on here and a lot going on in here. And it's going to take me a little while to understand this. Um, uh, but I do see one simple question I can answer. Uh, slashes when selected have a pitch. 
is that pitch governing the voicing. The pitch governs nothing. The slashes, slash notation and muse score are just regular notes that have had their note head that have had their note head set to a slash and have a special option set that forces them to always display on the middle line. So, uh, but they are just normal notes. And in fact, you can turn, and they have their playback turned off, but you can turn the playback back on using the properties panel. So the, th that is just the note that was entered for them and it has no real relevance to anything other than it's what will get played if you turn playback on. All right, um, okay. Kevin Johnson is now asking about uh, bends and falls. And okay, uh, the answer isn't what I would want it to be. Let's let's start by saying that. But uh, let me come over to my MuseScore Cafe theme music where I have one. Oops, that's the nightly build. Here's my MuseScore Cafe theme. Because there are, of course, some falls here. So let's check out what's going on at the beginning here. I'm going to play just that trumpet part. All right. So it played what it felt like playing. That was the default playback of it. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, Marla, by the way, you're asking about subreddit. Uh, I guess you're talking about when I had mentioned before about a question being asked. It's just MuseScore. You know, uh, there's a MuseScore subreddit. It's not, uh, it's not particularly well uh, populated or attended, but it's um yeah, it's a it's a play. It's another place you can go. I would consider it the fourth most useful place to go um, after the discussion and support space in my community. Clearly, the best. The MuseScore support forum also really awesome. Facebook, eh, Reddit, eh. Um, though that's in my order of where I think you're going to get the most useful replies. Um, so my community and the MuseScore forum kind of tied for awesome. Facebook, not really as good, but okay. Reddit has not a lot of expertise there, but, you know, some. So, um, so as for what control you have, well, basically we have no control whatsoever over how that is played. You can see the playback thing is currently grayed out. In MuseScore 4.2, they're currently working on some additional bends for guitar specifically, guitar bends that use this special syntax where it draws a little curvy line. And I don't know if it's going to work with any other instruments or not, but here is what I'm going to recommend if you want more control. What you can do is I'm going to have nothing selected and make sure that I'm showing invisible items. Uh, first of all, there was a bug here where falls after ties don't work correctly. And so I've actually put the fall on the note before the tie. Um, and that's what's actually playing back, I think. But uh, I'm going to create another new score. And we're going to, I'm going to show you how to use Glissandi to get a little more control over this sort of thing. So if I create a score and I'll make it for alto saxophone this time. And I add myself an A and I put, a, again, I will add that arpeggios and Glissandi palette and add the fall. This is just gonna play back how, oops, I need to select the note, then add the fall. This is gonna play back using an actual sample of a guitar, of a, of a saxophonist doing a fingered fall. And you have no control over how that shows up. Muse Sounds has some sampled falls, and if it doesn't have a sampled fall for that note on that instrument, you're gonna hear nothing. If you switch, if you go to the mixer, let me make sure I can see my chat. If you switch, if you switch to MS Basic, which is actually what I'm using for uh, the cafe theme, simply because the trumpet in Muse Sounds doesn't go high enough. If you switch to MS Basic, then instead of that sampled fingered fall, you're going to get kind of a digitally emulated fall. Yeah. Right. But again, no control over that. So if you want a little more control over this, here's what you could do is um, 
add instead. Uh, I think I'm going to find out if it works with Grace Notes, uh, and then uh, we'll find out. I'm going to add a Grace Note after that note. Uh, I got to add that palette too. My regular working palette has all these things already present. Oh, maybe I did already have it added. Grace Notes. Do y'all see Grace Notes? Grace Notes. Where's my Grace Notes palette? Oh, there it is. Okay. Grace Notes palette. There we go. I'm going to add a Grace Note after this note. So there's a Grace Note after. And then I'm going to pitch it, say, well, we'll pretend that this alto can play a low A. And now I'm going to write a bliss down to that note. So I will come over here and write a gliss down to that note. And then I'm going to select that gliss and come over to properties and playback, set it to portamento. Now. What? Come on. Oh, I guess it doesn't work with uh, grace notes on a single note like that. So that's fine. Instead of the grace note, I'm just going to add a real note and add the gliss that way. I thought for some reason that the gliss to the grace note after technique worked, but maybe it's only uncertain. Maybe it's maybe it, it worked in three and doesn't in four. Sorry, I don't remember. Uh, playback and set to portamento. And now when I play it, it'll play all the way down to that low A. Unfortunately, you hear the low A also. And so then you have to play other little games like if I try turning off the playback of that note, then it'll go down to that note, but not re-strike it. Then you can press that note and make it invisible, right? And then you have that going on. So there's things like that that you can do uh, to get a little more, some more options for your playback. It's still not tons of customizability for it. The new guitar uh, bend feature that's coming in 4.2 is going to be very customizable. I just don't know how much it works outside of uh, um, how much it works on other instruments other than guitar. And it's not there yet. Some of the support is in is in the nightly build, but most of it isn't yet. All right. So uh, once again, I feel I'm getting caught up here. Um, and yeah, the choral music um, is... In, in the United States, it's printed on music. It's bigger than, so A4 is a little, well, it's taller and skinnier than letter paper, right? Taller, but skinnier, taller, but skinnier than letter. Letter paper, if you hold it sideways and fold it, is just too small. And that isn't typically used for choral music. Instead, it's like nine by 12 paper that is then folded in half or some other custom size that's then folded in half. Um, it's called... Octavo is the 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 format the, the name for it. So, um, but it's not even that. There's not even one size for that. There's uh, different publishers use different variations on that. All right. So, uh, I'm I'm once again getting to being caught up here. Uh, there was one other question that was in. Uh, here that I do think I can add, and this is a, a, a simple one because the answer is basically no. Dave is asking, uh, is there a way, like he wants, he has a, a custom instrument where he's added an instrument called hand pans. I don't even know what that is, um, but uh, but he has a sound for it. And then he wants to add an instrument called hand pans to his score. Well, the only way to do that is add some other instrument. If, if there's no hand pan instrument in MuseScore, which I don't think there is, if I type pan, I'm going to get, uh, wow, I'm surprised there wasn't uh, steel pan drums. Um, is it just called steel drum? Yeah. So I don't know if hand pan is any, is any related to steel drum, but uh you would, you would add some other instrument uh, to your score, whatever you feel is closest. You'd add that to your score and then change its name. So you could add hand bells. I'm sure that's not really relevant at all. Ooh, hand bells shows up as two stays. I, I doubt that's, that is what you want. But then I think you can double click the name and it will bring up here and you can change it to hand pan and 
I'll just call it HP for the short name. So you can customize this and then you can go to the mixer and uh, you, you said you have this custom sound font, you can select it in here. So you can do all those things to set up your score, but there's no way to then make that available to other scores, except that you can then save your score as a template. If I take this score and then go to file, uh, save as, or just file save, um, and save it to my templates folder, uh, instead of my scores folder, if I just say save as, and then uh, go, right now I'm in my scores folder, but if I go up a level and then go to my templates folder, you can save your score to your templates folder. And then the next time you create a score, that will be available. So if you have an ensemble made up of multiple hand pans, set up a score with multiple hand pans, and then save that to your templates folder. Then you can create further scores from that template and they'll already have multiple hand pans in there. Now, if you wanna add a hand pan to an existing score, that's not gonna work. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that won't work there. Um, but, the templates are at least useful for that. So you could start with the hand pan um, and then add other instruments to it. But yeah, as far as adding hand pan to an existing score, you'll have, uh, you'll just have to do it manually, add some other instrument and rename it. Okay, yes. And um, so uh, uh, daylight savings time, thanks for the reminder on that, Dave. Uh, I, if, if yours just cut in, ours cuts in, ours starts, next week so next week is uh this weekend our clocks get set back an hour what that does to your start time if you're not in the united states i can't really easily say tomorrow will be the same yeah next week is when it's going to change sunday is when our time changes so all of next week's events will be offset an hour unless your times also change next uh over the weekend which at least for some of you they will so, um, but yeah, tomorrow will still be the same time. Next week, you'll have to do your own math to figure out. It's going to be still 1230 Eastern, but 1230 Eastern is going to be different if you're not in the United States. It's going to translate to something different for you. So you'll have to figure that out. All right. Um, so now I feel like I'm pretty well caught up and um, it feels like a good time to, uh, to just flip back and play out some music here. Thanks everyone for the questions. Got lots of stuff to uh, kind of keep me busy answering and it was all over the place in terms of what got answered. And I do wanna come back and I am gonna try to help with, I, I'm curious about that 16th note thing there uh, with the beaming across the bar. I, I do wanna see what I can do about that. Christopher Bartlett, I wanna try to remember to, uh, to, to check with the JAWS guy to see if he's managed to make these, get these improvements ready and uh, Kevin McDonald, I'm going to come to yours also. So those are three things I'm going to follow up on afterwards. So tomorrow, Music Masterclass, we will be talking about diminished chords. And uh, yeah, I'll be showing some examples and hopefully we'll have some scores posted that I can look at from some of you. So thanks everyone for today and see you next time. Bye.